Hello, my friends, and welcome to, or back to, the Dennis Prager Show. An important thinker in the world today is Douglas Murray, associate editor of the British, superb British publication, The Spectator, a senior fellow at the Gatestone Institute, and let me just tell you, folks, as I have said to you at least a dozen times, I refer to it every single day. It is one of the most important websites in the world, in my opinion, and it is the most important with regard to Europe, what's happening in Europe. But it's not only about Europe, but it's uniquely valuable there. He has a new book out, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, Islam. Douglas Murray, welcome to The Dennis Prager Show. It's very good to be with you. That's very kind of you. Where are you right now? I'm in Washington, D.C. Why? Uh, I was giving a speech here earlier about my book, uh, The Heritage uh, Foundation, and um, I'm here for another day breathing the air of freedom. That is so well stated. The I was just sent telling my listeners that the Amer- Amer- I would say the vast majority of Americans do not know, including conservative Americans, how unique American free speech uh, laws are, just affirmed by both left and right in the U.S. Supreme Court as compared to Europe or Canada. Canada has now made it a hate crime, prosecutable, if a person says, do not call me he or she, call me Z, and you don't call the person Z, you can go to prison. Yes, it's extraordinary. This is happening all over the Western world, and it's a profound assault on all of our origins. It's a profound assault on reason, on logic, on evidence, on all of the things that we thought uh, mattered, and which turn out to be able to be struck aside by a stroke of a bureaucrat's pen. Well, uh, when, I'm just reacting to your comment earlier that you're in the United States and you're you're relishing the the air of freedom, which is also under attack here by the same people as in Europe, the left. But uh, thus far, we were resisting much of it. The campus has not, though. The university uh, has become the American university is as unfree as anything in Europe. Yes, I, I'm I'm amazed. I have to say, uh, sometimes I, I, I occasionally have spoken on American campuses. Uh, I'm not sure I'd be allowed anymore. But uh, I've watched with amazement in recent years as absolutely everybody I respect has found themselves to be no platform from somewhere. It seems to me that almost nobody can speak in an American campus these days. Uh, It's a very sad sight. Uh, Parents are remortgaging their houses to make their children more stupid. (laughs) Do you know, the only difficulty in talking to you is that I agree with you. Uh, It's almost easier if I had a different view, but it's almost word for word that I say people are going exactly by word. People go into, uh, you know, they 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 go into debt in mortgaging their home Mm. in order to have their kids made more stupid and to boot reject everything the parents stand for. Yes, that's right. I've always hoped that there would be a corrective to this and um, have always assumed that certain of them would include that these, um, these uh, university educations that are being doled out are making people uh, unemployable, I mean, other than in returning to the academy and perpetuating the same stuff. But uh, it's, it's a very sad sight, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's really the only bit of America that reminds me completely of home, and not in a good way. No, I, I fully understood that. What happened in your last election? <laughs> our um, our prime minister uh, decided to uh, hit herself repeatedly over the head and then shoot herself in the foot. Um, it was extraordinary. I uh, we it's been said a lot that we live in an era where everything has become unpredictable. But uh, this, I have to say, even those of us who believe that it's become unpredictable had not even thought that this could happen. Um, Basically, Theresa May wanted to strengthen her mandate ahead of the Brexit negotiations, which began this week. And she had asked the public, who had voted to leave the European Union, of course, by a majority, if they would uh, strengthen her relatively small majority in Parliament uh, and call the snap election when she was a long way ahead of her left-wing counterpart. 
And then uh, over the course of a, a, a eight week campaign, uh, the lead that the Conservatives had narrowed. And then eventually, on election day, the public returned her as the largest party, but with a much reduced majority. So um, it, it's, it's a pretty hard election to read in all sorts of ways, other than the fact that there are a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, of people who are angry about leaving the EU and are voting tactically, a lot of people who are angry about what they took to be the prime minister's presumption in calling another election. Uh, but we now are in a situation where... A man, Jeremy Corbyn, who is a proper socialist and an unreconstructed one at that, who uh, has found himself to be a supporter of almost anyone, so long as they blow up the British people, um, is actually within sight of becoming prime minister. So we've got five more years of this uh, conservative-led government, and uh, I think that it is a very clarifying moment because people now realize um, what is just at the door. Well, that's the optimistic read. Maybe it's clarifying and they like what's at the door. Yes, I've wondered about that because the, the, one of the biggest stories of our recent election in Britain was that the, the youth vote, which had really not turned out in the, uh, in the Brexit referendum, there'd been almost overwhelming youth uh, support for remaining in the EU, but they didn't bother to vote. Um, at this election, they did show up and they voted overwhelmingly for Jeremy Corbyn and uh, I've spoken to a lot of young people who thought that, and I'm afraid that once again, I mean, we get back to the education system problem. Uh, these uh, uh, people who supported Corbyn have no idea what socialism really means. They have no idea that we've tried all of this many times before, and it's always been a catastrophe. They've never heard of the IRA. They don't know what Islamist extremism is, and uh, and they fall for this guy that they think of as a sort of grandfather figure. I mean, I say. You know, to, to, for Americans to understand what Jeremy Corbyn is, it's, it's basically a far more radical Bernie Sanders who also hates America and supports terrorists. Is it true that he actually at some point said that Hamas or Hezbollah, I don't remember which of the two, uh, deserved some sort of freedom or peace award? Oh, yeah. No, he, um, he, he has a video of him in Parliament welcoming what he describes as his friends from Hamas and Hezbollah. And that's just one. I mean, he spent his life supporting Hamas and Hezbollah. He, um, he spent his life supporting the IRA. When the IRA blew up the conservative uh, government in, uh, in the 80s and blew, uh, tried to assassinate Margaret Thatcher while she was prime minister at a hotel in Brighton, uh, uh, you know, Jeremy Corbyn invited um, the group that had tried to kill her to the House of Commons for tea a few days later. It's unbelievable the the extent of the crossover in this man's mind of politics with extreme violence. It's very, very worrying. Did the young people vote for Corbyn or against Brexit? Um, good question. I think probably a bit of both. Um, it's true that the Conservatives didn't run a campaign that was in any way positive. And it, they, they ran hoping that you could solely attack the left and solely attack Corbyn and that there was enough awful stuff on Corbyn that it would do it on its own. And unfortunately, they, they forgot that you do have to have a message of what you're planning to do other than, you know, keep the other guy out. And um, unfortunately, uh, there, was de there was definitely a, a lack of a positive message from the Conservatives that meant that a lot of young people were swept up, frankly, by the uh, the promises, mad as I think they are, uh, of Jeremy Corbyn and his uh, his uh, very far left Labour um, Party manifesto. I struggle with the question of which university system is doing more damage to the value systems of its students, the American or the British. I debated at the Oxford Forum two years ago, and the subject alone gives anyone an idea of what's happening on UK campuses. The subject was, who is a greater obstacle to peace in the Middle East, Hamas or Israel? Yes, I saw the that very... debate. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thing. yes, indeed. I'd stay on if you would with me. I, I, I encourage everyone to read his book, Europe, or The Strange Death of Europe. 
a good title. I have theories on it, and so does he, obviously. Immigration Identity Islam. That's a subtitle. The Strange Death of Europe. It's up at DennisPrager.com. 1-8-Prager-776. You are listening to The Dennis Prager Show. Hello, my friends. Dennis Prager here. Douglas Murray. A very serious and deep thinker at The Spectator, where he's associate editor in Britain, senior fellow at the Gatestone Institute, and brand new book, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, and Islam. So, I, I have said this for a while, you're saying this, you live there. How, how serious is the patient? I mean, how is 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 the European patient at, at, at a terminal state? I think so. Um, and although it's possible, and I say at the end of my book, The Strange Death of Europe, I say what the things are from the most basic uh, political decisions to the deeper spiritual and cultural uh, uh, issues we have to face that could get us at least into a better position, if not completely out of the position we're in. But um, it is very hard to see how uh, this goes well. Uh, And one of the points of writing this book, and one of the reasons why I wanted to come to America to talk about it, was because absolutely every single one of the issues to do with immigration, to do with identity, to do with Islam, and much more, are in Europe just much worse and further developed problems yes. than the ones exactly. that you have here in America. Exactly. That's the question. Do we, does, does America wish to emulate Europe? The left here thinks it's terrific. So it's interesting. I, you speak about the alienation of the, of the average citizen, as it were, from the elites. Mm. Is there a... I don't know the answer to this. This is truly, I've pondered this with my listeners for many years. Is there another example of the elites destroying their own society? Gosh, um, I mean, you could, if you wanted to go back to the fall of Rome, you've got a relatively close analogy. But uh, the situation we've got into in in the West, in particular in Western Europe these days, and as I say, in another form in America, is is just so complex now because there's such a there's a whole set of what I what I say is us and them issues. There's the issues to do with them, the people coming in, the migrants, some of whom are fleeing war, most of whom are seeking economic uh, preferment and a better time, a better better economic situation, and. Uh, there are all sorts of issues to do with that. But then there's the us issues of what is it about us that's made us think that our home can be the home for the entire world. And on all of that, on issues to do with what in my book I describe as, uh, um, in one chapter about guilt, the guilt complex that we have in the West, uh, the, the, the tiredness that goes on in Europe, the sense of civilizational ennui, the sense that maybe the story has run out of our civilization, and that, as it were, a change is as good as a rest. All of these things are very, very long-developed problems, and they're problems that our politics have brought us, but they're also problems that our culture has brought us, and which we, we seem incapable of rousing ourselves to an answer to. But I, I, it strikes me that most of the European elite, academic or media intellectual, artistic, if they were to hear you speaking to me now, they would just say, this guy is wrong, Europe is thriving, I don't know what this guy is talking about. Yeah, well, you know, they've, uh, they've got to take their chances then, haven't they? I was at a, an a event in London the other, the other night, and uh, there was a German, young German man in the audience who said, what are you talking about? The immigration has been great, and I mean, sure, there are some downsides, but look at the look at the cuisine that we get and things like this. And I, I said to him, you know, 
okay, fine. I mean, no one doubts that immigration brings some benefits. I doubt that bringing in an extra 2% of your population in a single year from the developing world, like Germany did in 2015, is such a great idea. But let's say you do that. Okay, the downside is that every now and then somebody blows up your kids with a nail bomb. Um, uh, you know, it swings and roundabouts, clearly, for these people. Right. So the question is, and I, I assume that you feel as I do, that the issue is far greater even than the the occasional terror bombing. Of course. there, Because there, there, there's a whole transformation of the cultural values of the society. Yes. It, 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 when, when I have read stories to my listeners, I've always wondered how accurate they are. As, as for example, are there cases, are there two things I'll ask you about Britain. One is, are there essentially... If de facto, not de jure, are there no go zones uh, because they're they're just too dangerous, generally speaking, both for citizens and for police. And uh, and the other is, is there any Islamification of British law? Two very good questions, and you're right. They're questions which people are often over um, are guilty of overcooking. Um, on the issue of no-go zones, I mean, I've traveled all across Europe while writing this book. There are certainly areas in Sweden, in France, and uh, to a much lesser extent in Britain, where they are certainly in enclaves that are entirely Islamic. And there are some enclaves, including in Sweden, where there are places where the, the police basically don't like to go and that when they do sometimes go, uh, when a fire truck goes, for instance, has to be escorted by police cars because the locals can turn on the emergency services. Now, that does happen. In Britain, that is not something that we have. In Britain, there are certainly areas that are entirely Muslim, enclaves of, of, of the country which would be unrecognizable to the inhabitants even a few generations ago. But it isn't accurate to say that there are places where, as it were, the writ of British rule does, uh, law does not run. But as for the issue, which is connected, of course, with the law and the Sharia law, there are in Britain, and I've, I, I've spoken to people who run Sharia courts and others in the UK, uh, they are, there are a, a large number of Sharia courts in Britain. They are meant to operate as um, the Jewish courts and, uh, um, and other religious and similar arbitration courts do as being subservient to British law. That is, you can oversee things so long as they don't go against the writ of the British state. The problem of this is, of course, and I've written about this a lot, and it comes up in my book, is that there are many times where basically the, the, the state could not possibly know whether the court in question has treated, for instance, a woman in the way in which British, court, British law allows it. And this is something I feel very strongly about, because you can... You know, it's not the case that the Sharia courts in Britain hand down death sentences or floggings or things. But the point is that the state has no meaningful way uh, to work out whether a woman looking for an Islamic divorce in a Sharia court in Birmingham this year is being treated fairly as she should be as a British citizen. In other words, as somebody once said to me in one of the Birmingham cases I was interviewing people in, somebody once said to me, all my life in this country I've been treated as a Muslim and never once have I been told my rights as a British woman. And that hmm. All right, got to hold it there for a moment. Douglas Murray, the book, The Strange Death of Europe. All righty, everybody, Dennis Prager here. And I'm speaking with a major European thinker, Brit, Douglas Murray. His book, I have it in front of me, I'm reading it, and this is that important. The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, Islam. So here's, let me, because I so respect you, I want to bounce my theories off you, and I, I, my, my listeners are probably tired of hearing me say this, but I tell most guests to my show, I have no issue with your differing with me. Do not feel <laughs> sort of you have to be pol have to be polite, but <laughs> don't worry. You don't I have to be in agreement. That uh, you're right. I'm not. I'm not worried about that. Okay. So I, I believe Europe has been dying since the end of World War One. Hmm. World War One knocked out national identity and knocked out religious identity from the Europeans, and there's nothing left after that because what they believed in led to carnage. 
that's what they believe, and to a certain extent, it was true. Uh, so, how do you react to that? No, I think there's something in this. I say repeatedly in my book that you know we've got to recognize that a lot of the troubles we have have foundations that are totally rational. Um, you know, it, it, it's reasonable for Europeans to fear themselves in some countries. You know, it's reasonable for Germany to be concerned and for German people to be concerned about them if they feel kind of expansionist this week, you know? Um, it, it, it's totally understandable. And at the same time, you have to work out what is an appropriate response to your history, what is a, a humble and uh, an appropriate response to your history, and what turns into being a suicidal response to your history. And, uh, you know, I'm all for appropriate humility in the face of mistakes from our past, just as everybody else should be. Uh, not to learn from the past would be a form of insanity, but, but that doesn't mean, particularly when you have millions of people who feel no such uncertainty about their past, or no humility about their history are moving into your continent. At such a time, it seems to me that the the kink, as it were, of being very self-critical becomes a form of masochism which is unforgivable and unsurvivable. So you and I think there's something unbelievably worthy called Western civilization, I'll even use a term that Margaret Thatcher used, which I use almost every day, Judeo-Christian civilization, that is eminently worth saving. I assume yes. then, I assume though, that that's the great divide because the elites would listen to me saying this and have contempt for it. Yes, and it's one of the great sadnesses of our time that there are so many people who do have contempt for it. You know, the, we, should, we should stop and think more often about why it is that the world wants to come to these countries of ours. Uh, they want to come uh, because of the attraction of our countries. You know, there is no migration of any size to Sudan or Saudi Arabia. You know, th there is not a great big influx of people from Wales to Pakistan. And there's a reason for that. It's because these countries are closed and authoritarian and poor and, uh, and with a lack of freedoms of the most basic kinds, which, uh, freedoms which we take for granted. And, and it seems to me an amazing thing that so many people in the West now, I can only think that they are so parochial, these people on the left, so enormously parochial in their thinking, that they've never been anywhere, they've never imagined anywhere else, they've never traveled anywhere else. Because if you have traveled anywhere in the world, and you're from a country like Britain or a country like America, you cannot help but realize how lucky you are to have been born where you have been. And, you know, who in such a situation would spend their lives spitting on the accomplishments they've been lucky enough to have inherited? Only somebody only somebody with severe problems of the kind I try to diagnose on a generational scale in this book. I'm telling you, we're, it's, it's so, we're so in sync. It's, it's, I wish we weren't. I, I wish you gave me reason to think that <laughs> I, I, I may be too pessimistic. So how does it feel to live in, in a society that you feel is committing suicide? I mean, how do you go day to day? Well, um, as I said, I mean, all of these things I diagnose in my book are warning signs to America. You have versions. Oh, of it totally. Here. I, I agree and with you. Listen, I thought if Hillary Clinton won that we had already tipped over. Yeah, exactly. I, I did not. Yes. Oh, I am totally with you. But uh, but she didn't win. All right. If you have any questions, Europe. You know, among other reasons why every one of you should care about what's happening in Europe because it is a crystal ball about America. That's why. You're listening to The Dennis Prager Show. Hi, everyone. Dennis Prager here. I want to reemphasize the importance of the subject, even if you're America-centric, and it's totally fine to be, but not America exclusively. Uh, I, you have to care about the world. It's fine to care about your society first. It's perfectly admirable. But you have to care about the world. But even if you only care about America, you, one must be intensely interested in 
especially Western Europe, because that is what half of this country wishes. To the entire Democratic Party in this country, Sweden, Britain, France, Germany, are ideals to aspire to. To those of us on the other half of the divide in America, they are precisely what we need to avoid. That's why I had to speak of a civil war. There, the, there is an unbridgeable gulf. This is a perfect example. The left regards what is happening in Europe as idyllic. We regard, the conservatives regard what is happening in Europe as catastrophic, as, to use his term, suicidal. He is a Brit, obviously, and he is the author, just come out of the book, The Strange Death of Europe, Immigration, Identity, and Islam. Let me take a couple of calls here from around the United States. 1-8-Prager-776 is the number, 877-243-7776. Tony in Palos Verdes, California. You're on with Douglas Murray and Dennis Prager. Hi. Hey, uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, I uh, met a guy from Switzerland last year. I was uh, eating dinner at, the, at a bar in a restaurant and having a beer, and he sat down next to me. Lovely guy, very nice. And we got into a discussion about Muslim immigration in Switzerland, and he said that they, he thinks they should take as many immigrants as want to come in. He said it wasn't even a choice. Uh, it was morally the right thing to do. I... Uh, brought up some stuff to him he had never even heard about and ended up recommending that he read The Looming Tower and some other stuff, literature that he had never even heard of. Um, Anyway, uh, I brought up the fact that Europe's not replacing their own population, and um, he agreed that they weren't, and I said, you're bringing in all these immigrants, and in 50 to 100 years, if you continue not to replace your population, you'll completely lose your culture uh does that not bother you at all and he just looked at me and very just completely fatalistically just shrugged and said it's happened all the time throughout history so it doesn't bother me at all that's a great call what do you say to that douglas murray how how could people not care well i this is uh i'm afraid not a not a not a story that's, that's new to me. It's terrible. It's a great example of, of this trend. But yes, there are, there are many people who seem um, so self-loathing, so tired, so civilizationally tired, as I say it, that they, they don't mind their own annihilation. And, you know, your caller there absolutely asked the right question. You know, the, the, the populations of Europe are being replaced by the decision of the bureaucratic and political class that has existed since the end of the last war. I give, uh, over the the course of writing this book, I've traveled all across Europe, from the north, the south, east, west, to the reception points where migrants come in on the Italian and Greek islands, all the way to the chancelleries of Europe. And the most amazing thing is that in a country like Germany, where an extra 2% of the population was added in a single year, you hear these strange claims like, well, we're an aging society. So we need new young people. If, if you believe that, by the way, if that is the case, there's all sorts of things you do before deciding the next generation of Germans should be from Eritrea. Masses of things. But you've got to be, you've got to just think you have nothing worth passing on to think that you can do this. And I think it breaks one of the most fundamental pacts of civilization, which is that you should pass on to your children the things that you inherited that you were lucky enough to have inherited. And we are at risk of passing on to our children a far worse world and a far worse continent than the one that we were born into. Right. And now, of course, the, the, it's so obviously true, and you would be called racist for saying it which aside from everything else is absurd since it has nothing to do with race. It's entirely a values question. But yes, nevertheless, I was, um, that's... I, I, this is on my mind because in this week since I've been out of the country, two uh, Islamist organizations in the UK uh, described me on the BBC as a hate preacher. Um, and uh, fortunately, the BBC has just had to, on live on air, uh, cut off its broadcasts and issue a formal apology to me for this. But this is the kind of thing you hear all the time now. People like me and people like you who are warning people 
not to give up their freedoms, are warning them to defend the things that are good in our societies and our culture, are called the hate preachers. And the people who are actually hate preachers, who encourage people to go off to other countries and sometimes in our own countries and cut people's heads off, are seen as the sort of peaceable wing of some movement. It's, it's an extraordinary and absurd situation we've got into. Oklahoma City and Terry. Terry, you're on. Dennis Prager, Douglas Murray. Hi. Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, my question pertains to Europe in general, but particularly to Germany because of the actions of Angela Merkel. Um, the Germans, of course, killed the Jews during the World War II. They feel bad about that. It's, it seems to be this is kind of what they're is animating this desire to have these uh, Muslim immigrants. So my question is, if you feel so bad about what you did to the Jews during the World War II, why are you bringing in masses of people who hate the Jews as much or more than the Nazis did? I mean, Hitler right. Terry, Terry you, are, you are a living example of why I believe that there is more wisdom in Oklahoma than in the entire <laughs> Ivy League uh, institutions of our country. I, I, that, I, I, I wish I could hug you. That's the, the way she phrased it. I, I would actually, it's, it's perfect. They're guilty over having killed the Jews, so they decide to bring in to Europe people who hate the Jews. That make, That's right. Well, I have a theory, and that is basically, and I love individual Germans. I've just been living in my home uh, for the last half year. But as a rule, Germany is always wrong. Back in a moment. I was going to talk to Douglas Murray for one segment, and after that segment, I thought, oh, we'll talk for one more. After two segments, I thought, no, oh, I'll talk to him one more. And I've talked to him the entire hour. And, uh, you know, at least it should help you in, in some way is that you should know that you have kindred spirits around the world. and That has to be some degree of solace as you watch your continent commit suicide. But uh, I don't know if anything could truly compensate for that. No, I think, I think I think you're right. Uh, uh, the The fact is is that civilizations like ours, um, uh, you know, are not nothing, and they can't disappear into nothing on our watch. And it seems to me, yes, an enormous encouragement that there are people, including the two callers you just had, who who completely see this. They they completely see this. And, you know, we, we, we in, in Europe are often browbeaten into silence. A lot of people shut up. A lot of people don't want to say the wrong things in case they're thought to be politically incorrect. And I think that what has happened in this country, in America, is is a great uh, um, rebuke to the the European passivity and the European tiredness. Is a reminder that actually the the future is in our hands, and we should we should carry it carefully and carry it well. But I think that the fact that people like the American public continue to realise that that they've got something good and that they should hold on to it and pass it on is uh, is an enormous inspiration and you know if if things can go badly wrong as they have on my continent in my lifetime then there's no reason why they have to keep going so these things are in the hands of people they're in our hands now that's entirely accurate jr in columbus ohio hi uh, hi dennis <clears throat> well uh love your love you love your show but your last caller I had chills when she said what she said, chills. Mm. And I listen to you a lot, and that's the first time ever it hit me that hard. And I think we're doing the same thing here in our country, just we're a little behind. That's right. That's the reason I've had Douglas Murray on. She did give uh, chills. I have said uh, throughout my career I have learned as much from callers as I hope callers have learned from me. To, through the emails, through your calls, the collective wisdom has been tremendous. Douglas Murray, I hope I meet you one day. Likewise, very much so. It's been an enormous pleasure to be with you and to be able to hear from your callers. Thank you, sir. The book, The Strange Death of Europe. It is strange. I don't know if anything good, anything nearly the, as good as Western civilization has killed itself. Usually it's bad people who destroy Western or not Western, any civil, any good thing. To have the good killed themselves, this is, uh, this is new. 
and it's why I speak about the dangers of the left every day I broadcast. Thank you, Douglas Murray. Thank you all. I'm Dennis Prager. Hi, everybody. Dennis Prager here. I'm going to be regularly speaking with Sebastian Gorka, intelligence intelligence analyst and deputy assistant to the president, very much involved in intelligence and in foreign affairs, and it's an honor to have him regularly on the show. So welcome back, Sebastian Gorka. Thank you, Mr. Prager. You uh, said we should make this a regular thing, and uh, we have. Thank you for the opportunity. I was just, by the way, just between us and my listeners, I was just invited to talk to a, a, a meeting of uh, Republican, Republican congressmen. So I'm going to let you know when I come to Washington, because it would be wonderful to uh, to meet with you and talk to you there. We uh, would love to have you visit us here at the West Wing. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. So I am reading a headline from the Wall Street Journal, Russia warns U.S., as risks rise in Syria. Is that correct? Are risks rising in Syria? Uh, Only if we don't keep to the agreements and the arrangements that we've already put in place, Dennis. So uh, we have to be very clear. Nothing has changed since January the 20th. We have deployed to that theater with one purpose and one purpose alone, and that is to crush ISIS. Our strategic objective is to stop the bloodshed in Syria. Uh, From the beginning, we established uh, so-called deconfliction channels with Moscow. We are not interested. We are not there to attack the Syrian government, nor are we there to get into uh, any kind of conflict with uh, Russian forces. We are there to crush ISIS, and whoever wants to assist us is welcome to do so. Right, but we did uh, shoot down a Syrian warplane attacking our allies who are fighting ISIS. So it, it's not, in, I, I think it's not entirely accurate to say, not that you're not accurate, it's just that I know your bigger picture and I honor it, but we're also there to protect our allies. Oh, no, I mean, look, the, the strategic objective hasn't changed, and there's no duplicity in, in what we are saying. The fact is, uh, wherever our forces are in any part of the world, Uh, they will take the measures necessary to protect themselves. That doesn't change our strategic objective in a specific theater. But if you endanger our sailors, if you endanger our Marines, our soldiers, our Coast Guard uh, uh, officials, uh, then we will take the requisite action, and that's exactly what happened. Right, but in the shooting down of the Syrian plane, you were endangering our Syrian allies, not, not so much American troops. You, you, meaning, uh, you meaning the Syrian government? Yeah, we, we, that, that action was not taken against the Syrian government. That action was taken against an individual that was endangering our soldiers or our airmen. So, so it doesn't matter where we are, what, what part of the world we are in, uh, we, will, we'll, we will take those measures. All right, so this, uh, this is a, a lacuna in my own understanding then. I thought this Syrian warplane was attacking our Syrian allies. I didn't realize the attack endangered our own troops. No, it, that, that's why this, this measure was taken. So it's, it's uh, with every other thing that you've seen reported of late, uh, these measures are taken because we have unshackled our military. So it's very important to understand that uh, in the last eight years, there was what I like to call the 8,000-mile screwdriver. Uh, we had tactical, literally tactical decisions being made out of the White House, out of the NSC. We don't do that anymore. As one tier one operator told me just a few weeks into this administration, a, a, a massive burden has been lifted off the, soldiers, uh, sol- the shoulders of our operators because we are allowing them to do what needs to be done. We are not going to second-guess them. And, and whether it is somebody endangering our own troops or whether it is somebody endangering our partners, 
that also means we will take action uh, and, and that doesn't matter what theater we are in, whether it's an aircraft, whether it's a naval vessel, whether it's ground troops, the rules of engagement now, impl- now apply in ways that maximize the protection of our forces as well as our partners and allies. We have also shot down an Iranian drone, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So is it fair to say that both the Russian government and I... And I just want to repeat something I, I tell all my guests. It's fine to disagree with me. It's a non-issue. But I, I, I just curious, it would seem to me that these are shocks to the system uh, in Moscow and Tehran. So I'd like you to comment on that when we come back. He is, of course, a member of the National Security Advisory staff working in the White House. Sebastian Gorka. I'll be back with him in a moment. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Talking to the White House, as it were. Sebastian Gorka, member of the National Security Advisory Staff, Deputy Assistant to the President. And again, thank you for being with me. So I I raised this question. Do you believe that our shooting down of the Syrian warplane and the shooting down of the Iranian, uh, what do you call it again? Drone. Drone, yeah. Uh, Do you think that these uh, shocked uh, Moscow and Tehran? Uh, I'm not sure shock uh, is that deep, but I do expect that several actions that the president has taken in the last five months have led to a fundamental reassessment by both of those countries and others as well uh, as to who America is and what role we are prepared to take in the world. Uh, I think, you know, your audience is very sophisticated, uh, Dennis, and they understand full well that the Moab bomb being dropped in Afghanistan and the 59 cruise missiles launched by the president in Syria are not simply actions about Afghanistan or Syria. Uh, They sent a very clear message about statecraft in general, about the rejection of strategic patience, a, a phrase, remember, that Otto Warmbier's father used this weekend to lambast the last administration's creation right. of vacuums around the world. I thought it was very telling that Mr. Warmbier used that phrase. And, and I think all of these nations, rightly so, are reassessing what they can get away with and whether or not the vacuums created by President Obama uh, exist today under a Trump administration. That's exactly right. I think that he, the father, has been under. It's, uh, it's only because the word is misleading. Undercovered, but he he yes. has been he has not been covered as would be warranted, because he is so outspoken in his condemnation, without using the term of the Obama administration, and so praising of uh, your uh, your White House, our White House, in in in, in securing the release of his son. Do you know anything more than we do about what led to his being comatose? Um, I, I tell all my friends, and I consider you and your listeners to be uh, friends of this administration, that there are certain things that we simply won't discuss uh, in open channels. Mm-hmm. There is a right time for all of these things. Uh, his death was, was just a matter of, of days ago. So um, fine, I understand. Unseemly, That's it would totally. be unseemly to talk about it right no, now. No, no, I, I appreciate that. I, by the way, uh, you, I, I doubt if you would know about this, but uh, not that I know you wouldn't know that I had just been talking about it. You're too busy in the White House, but I, you may or may not have seen this piece by David French in National Review about the uh, the lack of sympathy on the part of many left-wing comedians and writers when Otto Warmbier was sent to, the, to his concentration camp? I, I haven't seen it. And as, as, a, as a person whose father was actually tortured by communists and then given a life sentence at the age of 20, the same as Otto Warmbier, uh, a man who spent two years down a prison coal mine, um, I, I find this lack of self-reference, this lack of historic perspective, um, the, the fact is Stalinist gulag, the, the gulags of, 
of, of the Soviet Union are just a few decades away and one of the few nations in the world that still has labor camps is North Korea. So, so the idea that, that we can't relate to a young man who has literally lived the life of Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag archipelago today as an American, um, I have no other words except to say that's shameful. It's it's quite something. If you would uh, hear what I what I played, you would you would be embarrassed as an American that people could mock. He was mocked as a white, rich frat boy, and another piece uh, in in the Huffington Post was written by a woman who said, "Now he knows what it's like to be a black woman in America." This is the Huffington Post. Comparing yeah. out of warm beer in a North Korean torture camp to being a black yeah, woman this, in America. The, these are people who wish to divide us, Dennis. Um, I, the, the fact is, he was an American. Uh, and I don't talk about people's skin color because it doesn't matter and it shouldn't matter. And if you right. talk about somebody's skin color or their, their uh, uh, economic background, then you are divisive. You, you don't believe in right. one America. You believe in That's exactly uh, dividing right. people, exploiting tensions. Right. And, and Martin Luther King and the great civil rights leaders would look at you askance and say, but we're all Americans. How are you helping by what you are doing? You're not helping. You're actually making things worse. Finally, uh, your take on Paris and Brussels. They're not being covered much because, thank God, I, uh, no, nobody was killed. But uh, one was foiled. The other one, the, the uh, bombs went off, but nobody got hurt. Uh, but these were two uh, Islamist terror attacks. Do, do these warrant more attention than they're getting, or do you feel that they, they get the, a sufficient amount? Um, I, I think they need to be understood uh, really for what they are, and, and not, they're not being well understood. Uh, Al-Qaeda was obsessed with mass casualty. It's almost fair to say that 9-11 was too successful because afterwards they were obsessed with weapons of mass destruction. Uh, ISIS has learned from Al-Qaeda's mistakes, and, and they're doing classic guerrilla warfare. It's a knife. It's, it's, it's a truck. It's a car. Um, they're taking the war to the, the backyard of the infidel. And everybody has to understand, and this isn't, this isn't you know, chicken little. This is the reality of you know, living in San Bernardino, in Fort Hood, in Brussels, in Nice. The front line in this war is when you leave your house in the morning. And I want everybody to be aware of this. This isn't a war being fought 8,000 miles away in Mesopotamia. It's being fought on the streets of Western civilization. And everybody needs to be aware of that reality. Everybody needs to be tactically aware. And please, if you see something, you must report it because you could be saving lives. Sebastian Gorka at the White House. Thank you, sir. I'll catch up with you next week. Delighted. All the best. God bless you.